Well, hi everybody from Riga. Galatians 4, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I want to just uh, tell you ahead of time, we're going to be talking about how we have been adopted as God's dear children. That's a wonderful, wonderful argument and a wonderful truth that Paul is talking about here. So, let's, let's begin with, with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, confessing, Father, that we are sinners, we should not be alive even, and yet we have been called to your amazing grace, and you have adopted us as your dear children, and that we are in Christ, and look forward certainly to the hope of eternal life in your wonderful kingdom. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And yet we realize that this is not a gratitude of, uh, of words, but that we want to live, Father. Every part of our body, our thinking, our lives, our decision-making, in response to that. And we pray that you will strengthen us in our weakness. And that, as we will read, that you will send forth the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we might call you Abba, Daddy, Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with those for whom the reality of these things is fading, and that you will encourage them, and that you will help those who struggle in their lives with all manner of very difficult situations, those who have intense suffering, those who face death, who struggle with illness, with old age, with terrible domestic situations, those who are abused, those who have to work extremely long hours for low pay, those who are refugees, those who are on the run, we pray, Father, that you will be with each and every one of us, and that you will encourage us with the wonderful assurance and comfort of your love, as we see it in your dear Son. Please, Father, give each of us meetings with people this week, with whom we can share the message. Help, Father, us to, in our shyness and our weakness and inadequacy, help us to have those meetings and help people to say yes, and give us the honour of being able to serve you and your Son in sharing the good news of your love and of your kingdom and of his victory over sin and death. Please help us in this, Father. We pray, Father, that you will strengthen those who wish to return to the ways of the law, to legalism. We pray, Father, that all of us might cling on to the wonder of the purity of your grace. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us in our deeply personal lives, in our thinking, in our hearts, that you will come into our hearts. Grant us your Spirit graciously, Father. We want to have the Spirit of your Son, knowing that if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And we want to be his. With all our heart, we want that. And yet, Father, we're held back by our humanity, by our weakness, by the ties that bind. We pray that we might see beyond that, and we might see to your kingdom. So please encourage each of us, Father, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, I said we're going to talk about Galatians chapter 4. Well, it begins, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Well, you read the Bible, you've got to look at the context. This is chapter 4. Well, what about the context? Chapter 3 has said this, You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you haven't been baptized yet, send me a, a PM, send me a message or, or let me know. Get baptized. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and there is neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise of eternal life on this earth, the promise of the having God as your personal God and the blessing of forgiveness of sin. So, if we are in Christ, if we're baptized into Christ, then all that is true of him becomes true of us. He was the seed of Abraham, and therefore so are we. All that's true of him becomes true of us. So he was the heir, he is the heir of the promises, but we also are. 
But, he says, the heir, while he's a child, is just a servant. Even if he's Lord of all. Jesus, of course, is the Lord of all. So, you could receive the inheritance in those days before your father died. And if you want an example of that in the Bible, you've got the parable of the prodigal son, where he comes to his father and says, you're not dead, but give me the inheritance right now. So, the father could say, well, okay, even if I live to be whatever, 80, when I'm uh, 60, you can have the inheritance, for example. That's how it could have been. And so it is, Paul says, with us, that we are in Christ, we are therefore the heir of all things, as Jesus was, Lord of all he was and is, and we therefore can receive that as well. Because, he says, we are the children of God. But how are we the children of God? How are we the Son of God? How should we have a right to the inheritance of all things from God? Because we are in his Son, who is the Son of God. And so, he says, verse 4, when the fullness of the time was come, and he's alluding to how the Father could say, right, at such and such a point you're going to get the inheritance, whether I'm dead or alive. Well, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Clear evidence the law didn't pre-exist, but that's another story. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So then, Jesus was of our nature, exactly so that we might be able to identify with him, so that all that was true of him then becomes true of us. He was a son of God, so are we. Because we are in Christ. And that's why he was made of a woman, made under the law. He was made like us, absolutely. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we are adopted. We who were not the children of God are adopted into his family. Now, under Roman law and in practice under the Jewish laws of the time, parents could disown their children. They could disown their children and children could disown their parents. But if you adopted a child, you could never ever disown them. They could, at a later point, say, I disown my adopted parents, but you could never disown your adopted children. And, of course, you can see why. People might adopt kids and get think, ah, no, they're not mine. Ugh, no, I don't want these, these kids. No, no, hand them back. No, you couldn't do that. You couldn't just get out of it like that, saying, ah, I don't want these kids. Give them back. I, I don't want them. No. Once you adopted, that was it. You could never disown them. As I say, if they were your own children, you could disown them. But you could never disown your adopted children. They could disown you. And this is a good news that is almost too good to believe. That we have been adopted, and God is therefore never going to disown us. He is never ever going to say, Sorry, I'm tired of you, Duncan. I'm tired of you. Your ways, you're not clearly one of my family out. No, I can disown him. I can say, no, nah, I'm through with all this. I'm, I'm out of here. Yeah, we can walk away from him, but he will not walk away from us. Remember how the Lord Jesus says that he who comes to me, I will never in no wise cast out. It's the same idea. Now, <laughs> Anyone who's been in Christ for any period of time, you will have the sense that God has got a grip on my life, that he is really involved in me and he is going to be with me right through to the end. As Paul says, Philippians, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will keep on and on working with you. There's a passage in Job where he says, what is man? What is man that you should visit him every morning and try him every moment? He's basically saying, God, give me a break. Give me a break. It's too intense. You're involved. You're on my case. 24-7, every second, every nanosecond, you're involved. 
As David says, you understand my thought afar off. Before I even think it, you're thinking about what I'm going to be thinking about. You know when I stand up and when I sit down, my uprising and my sitting down. You know it completely. Now, of course, Job was wrong to say, uh, give me a break. But that is so. God is so passionately involved. So passionately involved in us. Now, we find that hard to believe, I think, because for us, we're caught up with the stuff of life, raising kids, going to work, looking after the house, doing the washing up, buying the food, cooking the food, all this kind of stuff. And with all the thought that that involves, when you think about God, I hope when you pray in the mornings and you pray in the evenings and give thanks for your food in the daytime, go to church on a Sunday or whenever, and you hopefully read the Bible every day, there's parts of our time when we sort of give it to God. And that is, I suppose, how it has to be in, in human life. But he is not just occasionally around for us. He is absolutely 24-7 involved with us and moment by moment and hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, nanosecond by nanosecond. He's passionate about us. So, we've received the adoption of sons. We have been adopted. God is never going to kick us out. It is only us who can say, if we're so foolish, I'm out of here. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God, on account of Christ, on account of being in Christ. Well, it gets even more wonderful. Sure, we were the adopted, we are the adopted children of God, but then God does something very special here. He sends forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, whereby we cry to him as a little child does, Abba, Daddy. In other words, you are not simply adopted sons. You are the actual sons. So close that you cry out to God, Daddy, Abba. Of course, Jesus in Gethsemane is the parade example. Abba, Father, if it's possible, let this cut past me. There he was in his absolutely most desperate crisis, and he calls God Abba. He calls God Daddy. And this intimacy with God is what well, he enjoyed, and may say, ah, but that's okay for Jesus. He was the only begotten Son of God. I was born of human parents and so on. No, that's not legitimate to argue like that because, because of this verse. He has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. This is a psychological transformation whereby God is Daddy, is Abba, is that close to you. Now... It's just the stuff of Sunday school Christianity to say, oh, well, any reference to the Spirit of God in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, is talking about miraculous gifts, and we don't have the gift of tongues and gift of languages and miracles and so forth. So it's all not relevant. This is a big mistake. Of course, those gifts of the Holy Spirit in the miraculous sense, sure, they're not around. Speaking in foreign languages, Rabbits out of hats, raising the dead, so on. No, that's not around. But the Spirit of God is alive and active, and God has sent that Spirit into your hearts. This is the arena of the operation of the Spirit of God within the human heart. Romans 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Well, that's clear. Knowing the love of God, that he is my father, my daddy. Well, you get that sense and that awareness by his spirit in your heart, in your mind. And of course, as soon as you start going down this road, people think, well, it's too touchy-feely. It's far more attractive, actually, to take the academic intellectual path and say, oh, no, no none of your touchy-feely stuff. Uh, it's all about whether you read the word of God and understand it right, and then you... You tick enough boxes and God's kind of pleased with you. This is not right. This is not at all how it is. It's all about God's Spirit coming into your heart. His Spirit, His mind, if you like, in your mind. 
And that is what every spiritually minded person wants more than anything else, to be spiritually minded, to have this, this wandering mind of ours transformed and changed. And that is exactly what he offers. And that is man's, believing man's greatest need. And that need is met in the gift of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22, another example really, where, where Paul says that we have been given the sealing of God, the guarantee of that we are God's children. We have been sealed and given the guarantee or the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Again, the guarantee is the gift of the Spirit in our hearts. Ephesians 3 is perhaps the, uh, the, the, the clearest example here, where again you see that the gift of the Spirit is in the heart. He asks, Paul asks, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. The gift of the Spirit is in the heart, is right in your mind. This is God, if you like, doing open brain surgery, open heart surgery, if you wish, on somebody. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, so that you may be able to understand what is that breadth, length, depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes human knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, with all the filling of God, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. This is a power of transformation within the human heart. And to him be glory by Christ Jesus. So, we start off by being adopted, but the wonder doesn't stop there. As I said, an adopted child under Roman law could never be disowned by the father, by the adopter. The Father is not going to disown us. Be assured of that. You can quit. You can disown him. But honestly, who in their right spiritual head is going to disown God? Who is going to look at the cross of Jesus? The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, as Paul says. Who's going to look at that and say, I disown you? I don't want anything to do with that. I don't believe we're going to do that. We're weak. Yeah, we're weak. That's the problem. We're weak. But that is not the, the barrier. Romans 7, Paul says, unfortunately, when I want to do good, I end up doing evil and I can't seem to quit. And we shall die imperfect. You don't get to the end of your days spotless and perfect as Jesus, do you? And so, yeah, that's the reality on, on the ground, as it were, but that is no barrier. Because God is not going to disown you. He who comes to me, Jesus said, I will in no wise cast out. And so because we are in Christ, and he was the Son of God, that is our status. But God works through his spirit to transform us so that we are in reality who we are by status. Jesus put it another way when he said in the context of talking about the gift of the comforter, the Holy Spirit, again, I call you not servants, but I call you friends. It's a wonderful idea. And he goes on, verse 9, and says, But now, after that you've known God, or rather are known of God, why do you desire to be in bondage to the law? I want to just focus on that. After that you have known God, or rather are known of God. That is a profound statement. But it's more that he knew me than that I know him. It is unfortunate that in many denominations, including our own, there is the idea that I was looking for God, and I searched for God, and I, and I understood this doctrine, then that doctrine, then that teaching, and then that, and that. And I kept reading the Bible till I found the truth, and then I got baptized. That is true as far as it goes, but far more than that, God was in search of you. So after you've known God, or rather are known of God, you see, God is not facing off against man over an open Bible and say, look, if you figure this out, if you get it right, then I'm there for you. If you jump a number of hoops, oh sure, I'm there for you. If you don't, well, you don't. And that's your, your fault. No. God is more proactive than that. He is reaching out to us. God is in search of man. Absolutely. 
I mean, God says to Jeremiah, go and run around the streets and the squares of this city to see if you can find a man for me. In other words, God is saying, look, I'm in search of man. I'm looking for people. And God says about David, I found David, my servant. He looked for him and found him. He says about Israel, I found Israel in the wilderness. He looked for them. He searched for them. He found them. Parable of the lost coin, the parable of the, the lost son, all of them, parable of the lost sheep. He is the shepherd who is out there searching until he finds. He is in search of you, far more than you would in search of him. But of course, when you searched for God, and we've all searched for God, and he searched for us and we met, well, that was a dramatic meeting, and there's the energy and the synergy of that meeting, as the parable says, that all the angels in heaven rejoice. And yet, although, as I say, God is in search of man far more than we are in search of him, we, we also have to respond. He will not force people against their will. But if you want, if you want him, then you find that actually he was looking for me anyway. As the old Yiddish proverb says, going out to find him, God, I met him coming toward me. That, that is so true. Going out to find him, well, I met him coming toward me. And he, he laments here that despite all this, you desire again to be in bondage. You're going back to the law. After all the wonder of these things I've spoken about, you desire to be in bondage. And he goes on in 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law. They had a strong desire to be under the law. To leave all these wonderful things I've just spoken about, or Paul has just spoken about, and say, no, no, we desire bondage. We desire to be in a, a ritual situation. And at first blush, that might seem very strange. But then you think, well, you know, Paul was going around baptizing all these Gentiles, or as a result of his mission, all these Gentiles were baptized. Why would they, as Gentiles, want to go to Judaism, to legalism? What, why? Isn't that a bit strange? You see it particularly in Paul's letter to Titus, who was on the island of Crete. And Paul says himself to Titus, look, the people of Crete are... Uh, uh, pretty lax moral people. They're immoral people, their morals are very lax. There they were selling things at greatly exorbitant prices to the, the boats and the sailors that just docked on their island. They had easy money, didn't have to do much, just make money out of the, out of the visiting sailors. They just came in, went off, you know, you could rip them off. And they drank too much wine, it's good climate, didn't work too hard, a lot of money, easy life, manana sort of attitude. And there had been people there baptised, and yeah, Paul is up against the problem. These guys want to go to the law of Moses. Well, why? Isn't that a bit strange? Isn't that kind of not quite what they would want to do? Well, at first blush, yes, but thinking about it, no, it makes sense. Because, this is a thing, if all these things that we've spoken about are true, which they are, that I'm in Christ. My salvation is assured. God will not reject me. If I die now, or when Jesus comes, I will be saved. I'm going to live forever. Wow. And by grace, not because of my works, my sins which I continue in, unfortunately, that's all scribbled, that's all dealt with. I regret it, but it's dealt with. Well, that is so wonderful. But that demands, it doesn't demand works in the sense that you've got to do works to get in this position, because it's not of works lest any man should boast. But that grace is so wonderful that it cannot be accepted passively. That demands quite naturally from me every atom of my body, every penny that I have, all my resources, all my thinking, night and day, all my, my best endeavour, my heart, my soul, my strength, everything absolutely will be given to that because I'm going to live forever with this wonderful God and as his very own child. Well, sure, we start to live that life now then, do we not? That's very demanding. And because we're human, the easier way is to say, well, I don't know if I'm going to be saved. 
Uh, well, sure, let's hope so. Um, but let's do, let's do another way. I'll do a few rituals once a week. You might even get away with once a month. Maybe pay some money. And just do, do that once a week. Well, now and again. And uh, I can then live the life that everybody else lives. Will I be saved? Well, I hope so, but I'm too humble to think that I will be saved. Who knows, I'm a sinner and so on. That's a far more attractive path. Far more attractive than to accept radical grace, which is, no, by God's grace, I'm his son. I'm adopted. And as I keep saying, the adopted child could never be disowned. He's not going to disown me. I am really going to be saved. I'm really going to live forever. Will I be in God's kingdom? I shouldn't be, but by grace I will be. That is so wonderful. So absolutely wonderful. That radical grace, that demands everything from me. But I don't want to give everything. So let's go away from this understanding and let's settle for a bit of ritual, a little bit of legalism, trooping that out to meetings once a week, get away with once a month. Um, and yeah, well, okay, let's say that salvation is there, but well, we don't know. That's far easier. And you can understand then why these Gentile converts were tempted to go back to it. And Paul is saying, look, focus on the wonder of it all, that you are saved. And I'm not against going to church, of course, but you can easily slip into this. Go to church once a week. You might get away with once a month. Do your thing. Do your ritual. Do your stuff. And then think, well, will I be saved or not? I don't know. No idea. hope so, but I'm a sinner. I don't know. That's the easy path. That is, and I'm afraid it's the wrong path. When Paul says, I fear, verse 11, that I've bestowed labor upon you in vain, if that's your attitude. Because you've missed the good news of the gospel. If I say, do you believe the gospel? A lot of you will think, oh, you mean, do I understand about the kingdom of God and Jesus and the Bible and the promises to Abraham and all that? No, I don't mean that. That is not belief of the gospel. That is knowledge about. Yes, I'm not talking about knowledge. Do you believe that that is true for you? Do you believe? This is the whole question. You say to someone, do you believe the gospel? The, the idea is, do you believe that you, by God's grace, are going to be in God's kingdom? Do you really get that? Do you believe that? Do you see it is all true for little me? Do you see that? That's the thing. That is the whole wonder of it all. And he keeps talking here about freedom. That because we are not even adopted children, but the Spirit of God has made us the actual children of God, because we are in Christ and all that's true of him becomes true of us, and God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. Because of that, we are free. And he develops this argument in, later on in this chapter where he talks about the bond woman, the, the servant girl of Abraham, who has a child, it's Hagar, and he said that represents Jerusalem, who is in bondage under the law. But then there is the child Isaac that was born of the Spirit, and that he represents us. And he concludes this chapter, So then, brethren, we are not children of the servant woman, but of the free woman. We are free. I want to conclude by thinking about freedom. Do you really want freedom? There is a, a sense in all human beings that, oh yeah, sure, I want freedom. I want self-determination. I want self-autonomy, whereby I can decide what I want to do. You see it used in advertising, don't you? There's a picture of a car, for example, a new car and an open highway, and the sunset, and whatever. Buy this car and you've got freedom. You can buy this thing or the other thing, freeway, or freedom, whatever. Get this uh, life insurance policy, or go into this business and you'll make money, then you can retire and you'll be free because you have money and you can do what you want. That's very attractive to people. And human beings are asking the right questions, but they don't want the answers, or they're looking for the answers in the wrong place. The idea of freedom, oh yeah. But in reality, if people are given freedom, 
absolute freedom. I don't think they actually want it. It's like truth. People say, yeah, I'm looking for the truth, man. But actually, if they found it, would they want it? Should we have all met people like that? See, yeah, I'm looking for the truth. They find the truth, but actually they, they prefer the search rather than the reality. Now, we have come to the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is that we, by God's grace, are the sons of God, adopted. He's never going to cast us out and transformed by his spirit to be actually who we are by status, actually the children of God, the son of God. Because we are in Christ, who is the Son of God. And yet, he therefore is the ultimate free person. But you want that freedom. You know, Paul talks in Romans 8 about the glorious liberty, the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is what we have in front of us, this is what we experience now. But Israel was set free from bondage in Egypt. Oh, yeah, I want to get out of here. And they were taken out. But then, oh, we want to go back. It was good back in Egypt. We don't like this life. We want to go back there. Just the same with, with these Galatians. We want to go back. We want to go to this law. I want to, I've come outside and I've seen the freedom of the rolling hills, but I want to run back inside. Seeing we are here in the Russian-speaking world, it reminds me of a section in... The Brothers Kalmazov by Dostoevsky, epic Russian novel. And there's this bit where Jesus comes back to the earth, and he comes to Russia, of course. And he's arrested, he's put in jail, and he's in his prison cell, and he's going to be sentenced to death the next day. And the uh, procurator, what did he say, prosecutor, comes to him the, the night before in the cell, and he says, you know, Jesus, I actually like you. I have to give you the death sentence tomorrow, but you know there's a way out. I want to get you off this. He said, look, I, and I also said, I generally don't quite understand you. What are you doing all this for? Why have you come here? And Jesus says, because I want to set men free. And the prosecutor says, but you're doing this to set people free? Yes, Jesus says. But he said, but don't you get it that actually people don't want freedom and they don't actually need freedom? And Jesus says, yes, so I do understand that. But there's just a few who do. And that's it. That for freedom, we were set free. But people don't actually want that. It's too demanding. Jesus said, if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. This is the most radical form of, as I say, self-autonomy, self-direction freedom, whichever way you want to put it. That is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. In a parable, Jesus touches on this, I think very profoundly, when he says, well, I'm the master of the house and I've given you talents and money, etc. to trade. It's not yours, it's mine. But in this life, you are to use it wisely. When I come back, I will judge how you've used it. And he says about the unjust steward, if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, how can you be given that which is your very own? Uh, implications of that are extremely deep. We are given that which is not ours, that which is his, and we are to use that wisely. And if we use that wisely in this life, then when he comes again, we shall be given that which is our own. I'll repeat it again. If you can be faithful in that which is another man's, how can you be given that which is your own? So although, sure, we are given it, it is a gift, the idea is that in the kingdom of God, we shall have that which is our own. Sure, we were given it, but that which is our very own. The kingdom of God, in that sense, will be the ultimate freedom. Not to do as you want, but the ultimate freedom to be as you really want to be. And the purpose of this life is to elicit in us that desire to go God's way. That desire to be spiritual. That desire to live life and be according to the characteristics of his name, of his personality you know, revealed to Moses and Exodus. That that is to be for us 
what I would love to be. You, know, you look at the cross of Jesus and you see him there and you think of his life, perfect obedience, absolute spiritual mindedness. And the point of this life is that you look at him there and you think, yeah, that is the man that I fain would be. That is the man I fain would be. That's the man I would love to be. And I, I can't get there. Romans 7. Unfortunately, I can't. For whatever reason, there's no point in going into all the details, but for whatever reason, I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to die perfect. I'm not going to get to the level of Jesus. That's how it is. But I would love to be him. Well, if that's what you would love to be, that is who we shall be in God's kingdom. And we shall live forever in his grace, and yet we shall be free. But as I said, as Dostoevsky said in my little thing there from the uh, Brothers Karamazov, the human beings don't want it. It's like, oh yeah, I want to find the truth, man. You find it, but people don't want it. Ah, I prefer the search. We have, by God's grace, come to a point in our lives where we found it. We found the truth. We have found the ultimate truth, which is not a set of theology, no, no matter how correct, but Jesus. And the ultimate truth is that if I die now, if I get a pain in my chest, and I think, oh, hang, this is it. Or you're dying there in a hospice from cancer. Or, bang, that car just comes into you and you think, this is it. Whatever. If I die now, if you die now, we should be able to say, yeah, I will be in God's kingdom. It shouldn't be there, but by grace I will be. Or if Jesus comes back now, suddenly the heavens are torn apart and there's an angel says, he's back. This is it. And you think, wow, this is it. Yeah, this is it. We should be able to say, yeah, I will be there. That is what faith in the gospel and belief in the gospel, remember belief really means trust, belief in the gospel, trust in the gospel, that is what it is to believe in the gospel of the kingdom of God. That is what it is to believe in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What can we do but celebrate this in the way that he asked us to, which is in the... Uh, in the bread and wine. So let's give thanks for, for the bread. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this symbol of Jesus and all that we have seen and known in him. We thank you, Father, that we can celebrate that we are in him, that all that is true of him is indeed true of us, that we, like him, are the seed of Abraham. And we, like him, are your Son. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us in the days that remain in this life, that we might be transformed by your Spirit, that we might become, in reality, what we are by your grace and status. For his sake. Amen. Let's give thanks for, for the cup. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we again thank you for this symbol of his life, his blood, his life, all that he wants. We thank you and we take it to ourselves with both hands, as it were, in gratitude, seeking, Father, that truly, this may not be mere symbolism, but that, but that really you will send forth the spirit of your Son into our hearts whereby we might cry, Abba, Father. Father, we want you to be that close to us. We want to have that intimacy with you, to call you Daddy. And we pray that you will guide us and transform our hearts, so that that is how it shall be in this life, and how it shall be forevermore. For Jesus' sake.